We are joined today here in the studio by Dr. Beth Dunford, who is Vice President of Agriculture, Human and Social Development at the African Development Bank. Also with us, we have Dr. Sue Armstrong Brown, who is the CDP's Global Director of Environmental Impact. And the CDP is a, a non international nonprofit organization that helps companies, uh, cities, states, and regions disclose their environmental impact. Valerie Mazan is a general manager of Danon Communities at French food giant Danon. Thank you all, ladies for being here with us, for taking time to be in the studio with us. If we could please start with the role of development banks, which have traditionally been uh, uh, organized, uh, expected, really, tasked with closing the gap in funding. So this week, the African Development Bank has made uh, a new commitment to increase your funding uh, in relation to the water crisis. Please tell us about this commitment. Great. Well. Um, thanks a lot um, for the question and for being here on the show today. And water and sanitation is a huge issue, as we know globally. And in Africa, there are more than 400 million people who do not have access to clean water. Um, almost 800 million people who do not have access to basic sanitation. So those numbers are huge. That leads to, of course, we know um, sickness, um, loss of productivity. And just to give an example, uh, women who are normally shouldering the burden of water collection um, are spending so much time collecting water, and this is time when girls are not going to school, uh, they're not doing other things they need to do, caring for their children, being economically productive, and the rest. 40 billion hours in Sub-Saharan Africa are spent collecting water in one year. This is a huge amount of time invested in a task that should be so simple. So that's just one way to really sort of conceptualize um, how difficult this is. So the African Development Bank is very committed to investing in water and sanitation and supporting African governments in their goals uh, to achieve universal access. And so over our five-year strategy, 2021, 2025, committed to investing um, $6 billion in the water and sanitation sector. And so, you know, as we heard, you know, that's, that's not going to be enough. This is an important investment. We're very committed to doing it. Uh, but it won't be enough to, to gain universal access, as, as we're talking about. So what does that mean? Um, so when we support country governments, we're increasingly looking to see how we can use these investments to catalyze private sector investment. Um, how do we do this in a way to increase private sector investment in the water and sanitation sector? Again, this is something that's growing. And you know, increasingly, governments are looking towards public-private partnerships, where governments de-risk investment either by funding part of the project, some of the infrastructure around it to make to lower the barrier to entry and make it cheaper, or by getting guarantees on loans. So there are many, many different ways to really de-risk private sector investment in something that heretofore, you know, we haven't really seen private sector lead the way. So really we can then sort of, you know, multiply our investment um, several fold, fold. So I think that's the way to do it. Now importantly, um, to do this, it's really important to make sure that you know, products are well developed. Um, and, and I can talk a little bit about that more later, if you'd like. So this new commitment, yeah. where do you think it's going to make uh, the biggest impact? So I think that th this commitment will make the biggest impact in places where, again, we can work with governments to um, design very well-prepared projects, investable, bankable projects that can attract the most private sector investment. And in places where governments are looking to the private sector to really invest in their water and their sanitation sector, because that brings not only a lot of resources that are very much needed, but also brings innovation, creativity, technology that is really, really important to advance uh, the water and sanitation sector. You started to talk about this, but uh, is it enough we know it's not enough, financing from uh, development banks. How much of a gap are we, are we talking about here? Well, you talked about over a trillion dollars of investment globally. Um, you yes. know, a large portion of that, of course, is in Africa, where the sort of access is, is lower than in other places. So it's going to take a lot. And I think you know, I'm, we're talking about here you know, significant public sector investments, private sector investing in big, you know, large infrastructure projects that are needed. But again, we also have to think outside the box how do we get you know, urban sanitation uh, working? Now, it might be you know, large piped sewer systems. 
Uh, but there might be other creative entrepreneurs. How do we support more entrepreneurs to come in this space with out-of-the-box ideas about how to deliver sanitation in a way that, again, really, you know, really speaks to that circular economy where we can have localized systems that uh, provide a sanitary environment, but also use, um, you know, the products of that sanitization to to you know, uh, provide fertilizer, uh, biogas, and the like. So really getting that creative solutions from private sector actors um, to really deliver sanitation and also productive uses at the same time. So we've been uh, in Alasha. We were talking about uh, the Global Commission on uh, the Economics of Water. They have uh, their inaugural report out, and they talk about a new economics of water, including the need to change the current thinking that public institutions such as the African Development Bank are meant to uh, close the gap. Right. Right. So this filling the gap, a market failure view has to change where the public sector is supposed to fill the gap, where there's a lack of private sector funding or investment. The, the commission is instead advocating for market shaping to shape the economy to be more inclusive and sustainable and to actually design tools that are outcomes oriented. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that recommendation, Beth? I, I think it's great. I mean, obviously the, the, the goal has to be outcomes and these bankable projects that that we're supporting governments to design have to be with the outcome in mind. More people have access to water, more people have access to sanitation, it has to be inclusive. And that's part of what we do in supporting governments to design these programs is really making sure they do put climate right at the center, that they are, they do think about inclusivity. Um, and so, you know, that's what we're working towards as we move forward to support countries in their sanitation and water goals. Sue, do you agree with the Global Commission? Oh, absolutely, yes. And I mean, I think it's fascinating to hear about the thinking that's been going on in the bank. Um, one, of the, one of the things that's really clear from the work that CDP has been doing and the information that corporates have been telling us is the scale of opportunity that's there for water-related investment and business decisions is really very big. So um, I think we're all uh, slightly in the habit of talking about the need to raise money to close that trillion dollar gap. Yeah. Um, and we absolutely have to do that and things like the um the wash infrastructure that you've been talking about that just requires investment now um but even there it's an opportunity um some of the corporates that disclose to us have told us that where they have made that investment and they have brought the pipes and the pumps and the taps and the toilets to the communities that are their employees they see a reduction in sick days they see higher productivity so even that investment which needs to be made in any case actually represents, if it's, if it's processed in the correct way and is understood, that's a business opportunity. Uh, we're going to look at uh, more CDP research uh, very shortly, but Valerie, first, what's your perspective? Is it time for a new economics of water? I think it's interesting what you are saying, and we see uh, the role of, uh, indeed, bank of development and corporates. When you were talking about new enterprise thinking out of the box. This is really what we are seeing on the field every day. You know, I'm going on the field very often and I meet <coughs> entrepreneurs, I meet uh, consumers and they are in fact on the market solution. Uh, I'm more on water access, uh, yeah. but they are solution on the market in which you can invest. Mm -hmm. They are small today, but they can scale. So for me, there is a huge opportunity, and this is what we do at uh, Danone. So I completely align with what you are saying. And there is a role for corporate and bank of development. Yeah. Now, funding uh, for water-related investments are currently far outweighed by funding flows to other sectors, agriculture, uh, energy, urban development, and all of these increase pressure on water resources and exacerbate exposure and vulnerability to water-related risks. So at the moment, there's inadequate accounting of uh, these uh, water impacts. So uh, Beth, what steps uh, is the African Development Bank taking or taken to begin aligning with this, with these risks? So I think, um, I think if I understand your, your question carefully, I mean, I think that we're looking at sort of what are the climate risks and how do we put climate at the center of all of the designs that we support countries to do? So that's important. Then we also look at, um, you know, we do, we look at studies to see, you know, water usage uh, generally throughout the country. You know, what are the, there's so many people that use 
water, water used for so many different things. We do a lot of multi-purpose um, interventions where we're really looking at projects that do water uh, for, for consumption, water for industry, water for agriculture. And I think when you really look at these multi-use systems, then you can really see how can the water be efficiently used, and importantly, how can the water be priced? How can the water be managed in a way that everyone is really paying their fair share to really ensure the sustainability of the resource, the sustainability of the infrastructure that's, uh, that we're working to support to build? We're going to look at how the private sector is, is doing uh, on this uh, uh, situation. But uh, first, it is important to acknowledge that um, public finance right, in such projects is dwarfed by investments uh, from private uh, financial institutions. right? A and again, with this uh, insufficient accounting uh, of uh, these water impacts, uh, which has been recognized as a material threat um, by some of the most influential institutions around central banks. We have this uh, video clip of Frank Elderson uh, on the executive board of the European Central Bank. Let's listen to what he had to say. Water shortages and water stress do not just severely impact citizens and firms. Analysis confirms that such shortages and stress can also impact the financial sector through the loans that it extends to citizens and firms. The scarcity of water can generate business interruptions or create costs for companies due to the need to relocate production sites to different areas. Water-related hazards such as floods can permanently damage a company's assets like office buildings and production plants. And these channels can lead to lower corporate profitability higher operating costs and debt levels and make it less likely that a company can repay its debts. And this leads to higher risks for the financial sector. Water stress also impacts energy production. Research from the World Resources Institute shows that 47% of the world's thermal power plant capacity and 11% of the hydroelectric capacity are located in highly water-stressed areas. And such locations are, are problematic because both thermal and hydroelectric power are highly dependent on water to produce electricity. Moreover, water is essential for a wide range of ecosystem services, ranging from climate regulation to pollination. Through these interlinkages, Water scarcity and water stress can deeply impact economic activities and in turn financial institutions that finance those activities. Several central banks and international organizations have started assessing the exposures of financial institutions to ecosystem services. And at the European Central Bank, we also are conducting internal analyses to understand the dependency and vulnerability of your area banks to nature degradation. And preliminary figures for Europe show that approximately 60% of corporate loans issued by your area banks have a borrower who is highly dependent on water supply and the services linked to it. Last year, the network for greening the financial system representing 121 central banks and supervisors worldwide issued a statement explicitly acknowledging that very much like climate related risks, nature related risks can have significant macroeconomic and financial implications. And therefore, both such climate and nature related risks need to be considered by central banks and supervisors in the fulfillment of their mandates. There can be no doubt that these risks encapsulate water-related risks. And therefore, there can be no doubt that the topics being discussed and concluded um, uh, here at the UN Water Conference are of keen interest to central banks, supervisors 
and to the global financial sector at large. Water-related risks need to become fully embedded in the pricing and flow of finance in our economies. The functioning of our economy depends not just on the flow of finance, but just as well on the flow of water. Our prosperity and very survival depend on it. It is high time that this vitally important clean water dependency is recognized by all, including by the actions of the world's financial supervisors and central banks. Thank you. So that was Frank Alderson of the European Central Bank. Now, Sue, uh, do we know how much money is actually flowing uh, into companies and projects which uh, could actually be making the water crisis worse? Well, we can't put an exact figure on it, but sadly, it is most of it. Most of the trillions of dollars that flow through our economy every day are not targeted at a sustainable water future. There's a recent estimate by JP Morgan, really interestingly, that suggested that 98% of um, the money flowing through the world right now is not sustainably spent. So to put it another way, that's $1 in 50. That is helping the water crisis. $1 in 50 and all the out others, of every dollar? Yeah, and all the others are not. So, but that's, that's one estimate. Um, there, there are others, but I think we can all agree that currently we're not headed towards that sustainable water future that we want to see. But there are loads of opportunities that we could take right now that would move us in that direction. And the business leaders and the financial institution leaders and the political leaders, and we've just heard about the banking leaders, are increasingly aware and able to understand what the risks of not acting are and what the opportunities of acting will be. Um, so is it time then for uh, better disclosure of uh, water footprints <laughs> by, the, it, by businesses? It really is, yeah. So for, for those who, I mean, this, this sounds very dry, but it's so exciting. Um, CDP offers a platform for a global platform for corporates and financial institutions to disclose their environmental footprints, including on water. Um, and it all starts with that. It all starts with understanding. There's that old mantra that what what gets um, measured gets managed. Mm -hmm. If we're not measuring our environmental footprints, if we're not understanding what our water risks are and what our opportunities are and our dependencies and our impacts are, how will we ever solve this problem? So. The disclosure um, is the beginning from, from our point of view. We've seen an 85% increase over the last five years in the number of companies disclosing to us on water. So we're really optimistic that the world is waking up to the, the, the worrying risks and the exposure of not acting and needing to quantify and understand and set business strategies that help make wise decisions for water. So these companies who are disclosing their water footprint, what's actually motivating them? Um, well, there's about 4,000 last year, the highest number we've ever had. Major global companies have disclosed to us on water. Um, some of them are doing it because they've, got, they've already set, we've got honourable company here that's in this position, um, a business strategy that requires water responsible approach um, and would naturally disclose because they, they are um, in the system already and wanting to be part of it. Others disclose because we um, work with investors um, and authorities who request that the, the people that they're investing their money in or the people in their supply chains disclose because they want to have the data. We collect it and give it to them. They want to have the data about um, the water risks and opportunities that affect their money, not surprisingly. Um, and so that's another motivator for, for corporates to disclose. Okay, yeah, the Global Commission is uh, uh, urging that, recommending exactly that, that efforts should be accelerated uh, to disclose this water. But transparency brings the sunlight. We can't understand what's happening unless we have the information and that will inform good, wise decision making. And that's the insight that drives the action. Otherwise, we're just operating blind. Mm. So, Sue, the uh, CDP recently published research that uh, shows how private financial institutions are valuing water. We are going to dive right into this after this. Here in South Africa, our climate is very close to the tipping point in terms of rainfall and temperature change. So much so that in 2018, four million of our citizens were just days away from running out of water. And we're seeing the very real effects of climate change on businesses across the country. This poultry farm is one of the largest in South Africa and feeds millions of people every year. 
It belongs to Astral Foods, a large business listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. And the stock we at MNG hold in our portfolios on behalf of our clients. Clean water is essential for a facility like this to operate. But recently, due to water shortages, it had to halve its hours of operation. Over 3,000 people are employed here, and it's the biggest employer in the area. If a facility like this can't operate due to lack of water, it's not only bad news for investors, but it's catastrophic for the local community around us. But it isn't the only key industry to be affected by the water shortages that we're seeing. If action isn't taken, the effects won't just be felt here, but right around the world. So, Sue, what were your findings? Are financial private uh, companies valuing water more or not? Well, it, this, is, this is really quite exciting. So last year, for the first time, we asked banks, um, investors and insurers to tell us about what they thought about water and how they were valuing it. And fantastically, we got 275 financial institutions giving us their water data across all six continents. They are institutions that control $3.7 trillion. So we're talking about substantial, important influences in the economy. Um, and, and that sets a really interesting baseline for us. It's obviously the first year we've done it, so we, don't, we can't tell any trends here. But we're very optimistic that um, that number will grow because one of the things that they told us was that they can identify water-related opportunities worth more than $200 billion. And that wasn't all of them. Not all of them had done the sums yet, as a proportion of those disclosures had done them and were identifying water-related opportunities at that scale, which says that as soon as this information is available, um, it's going to be attracting more interest. Others will also be assessing what their opportunities will be, and that's going to drive an increase. That is encouraging, but 275 institutions... It's, part, they're, it's a drop in the bucket, really, uh, isn't it? So time is against us. What's the quickest way to educate the sector and shift investments in the right direction? Yeah, no, time is against us. Um, that 275 was only about 20% of the financial institutions that we asked to disclose to us. So we'd like the other 80, please. Um, but yes, we can't... We, we have to... Uh, advance on all fronts. So there's a number of things that, that can accelerate the pace of change. One is government action. So ma moving to mandatory disclosure, we were talking about the, the reasons why a, a company or, or a financial institution would disclose. Um, governments requiring them to do so is one reason. Uh, at the moment, only of, of the, all the G20 members, it's only the EU and the UK that have a really comprehensive set of requirements for water. So that's certainly space to grow there. Government action could drive it. We don't have to wait for government action. We don't always see that moving as swiftly as we would like. So probably the best way is to grow awareness of the opportunities and the risks. There's, our last year's results showed that there are $15 billion worth of assets either stranded or at risk because of water-related water issues and that's, that's just not something companies can bear. So the more we can grow awareness and also grow capacity in, in our economic sectors so that people can address and understand them and mo most importantly take action in the way that you're supporting. Um, it all comes to nothing if we can't facilitate action and awareness is the first step that we can take. Yes, talk alone is not going to solve this crisis. So $200 billion of opportunities at least, right? Valerie. What do you think it's going to take uh, to boost interest in water-related investments? Isn't $200 billion enough? <laughs> well, I think it will take time, unfortunately, but we need to act now. And I think we need proof of concept. I need, we need to prove that it works, that there are opportunity and that we, we can make it working. And from there, we can replicate and scale. And this is really what we would like to do, at least at uh, Danan. We're going to talk about what Danan is doing very shortly. Beth, first, what do you think is going to help attract more investments into water-related investments? Well, <clears throat> well, thanks. I mean, we need a ton of investment. And then you look at a continent like Africa, we need even more, right? And then it's seen as a riskier place to invest. So how do we get companies like Danan, who are trying really innovative things, to come to Africa and come to some, you know, across the continent to really roll out these investments? And I think that's where, again, you know, how can we partner with companies like Danone, uh, like any, like companies everywhere, all different sizes of companies, to really help them invest in places where they might need a little bit of support to lower the barrier to entry, a little bit of support to de-risk the investment. Um, how do we build the capacity of some of these smaller enterprises with 
very, very creative ideas to get them to invest. And I think that's where, again, this blended finance really, really plays a role. And that's where we're going with the African Development Bank. All right, let's look at some solutions now. Uh, Valerie Dunnon has just launched a new fund uh, for access to water. Please tell us about it. Yes, yeah, so Danone with Incofin has just launched last week uh, a new fund which is called Water Access Acceleration Fund. And uh, really the idea behind is, uh, first of all, Danone is committed for, for years uh, to give access to safe drinking water to as many people as possible. We have started 15 years ago with uh, the Impact Investment Fund of Danone called Danone Communities. Uh, I mean, 15 years ago, it was, it was quite uh, uh, visionary uh, to decide really to finance small water enterprise locally to give access to safe drinking water. And after 15 years, we have a portfolio already of 12 businesses. So it's a small unit of water. They treat the water locally and sell it at a very affordable price to the community. And those businesses are reaching every day 10 million people. Mm -hmm. So 10 million people every day have access to safe drinking water through uh, those businesses. And as I was saying, I'm going on the field very often and I witness when I discuss with consumer and water entrepreneur, the power of this solution, but also the obstacles. And the power, it works. It gives access to the family around. It has an impact on health. It has an impact on gender equality. Mm -hmm. It has an impact on education. So it works. There are solutions. And we have seen also throughout those 15 years, more and more small uh, enterprise like that. So the sector is getting mature, more mature to get invested. The obstacle is the fund. So very often they have difficulty to find fund in order to grow faster. Mm -hmm. So that was the idea behind this fund. So it's a very pioneer fund uh, that has been launched within Cofin last week. Why is it called a pioneer fund? Why uh, in Cofin? Alors, um, why pioneer? First of all, because it's only dedicated to safe drinking water. There is no other fund dedicated to safe drinking water. You have lots of wash fund, which is really good, but none on uh, uh, only uh, water access. Uh, it's impact first. So it means that uh, the asset manager will be paid only if the impact is reached, which is very unusual. Outcomes oriented. Yes, exactly. Right. And the objective is to reach 30 million people by 2030. And the third element for which we call it pioneer, it's because it's blended finance mm -hmm. and it's with partners. So in fact, in this fund, you have corporates, but you have Bank of Development, the DFC, yeah. IFE, uh, IFU, North Fund, uh, financial institution. And the idea was really to partner all of those uh, actors in the same fund in order to show that we can work together to impact uh, at scale. So what next, Valerie? Ah, next. <laughs> so we have just closed. The, fir the first closing was at 36 million. And we are looking at the second closing between 50, 70 million, 70 million. So it's a call to action to any other investors or corporates. If they want to invest in the fund, please reach out to us. So do you imagine a future where more such financial products exist that help the water crisis and not hurt it. Definitely, and it has to, to exist. We, ha we need to be innovative, we need to be creative, we need to dare risk, as you were explaining. In this fund, for example, it's Danone who is dare risking the other investor. So you were saying it's often the bank of development, but there are other ways of doing it. So yes, uh, and, and I'm sure we will find new ways, water bond or whatever, but we will find new ways to finance and we need to. Uh, Beth, what do you think is needed for the financial sector to be moving in the right direction to help not to hurt? So I mean, we, we need funds. We need to use them well. I think um, spending time to prepare very strong bankable products that are ready for investment. Also, being creative about how we can fund some of these smaller, more creative actors like you're talking about. But some of those actors also need technical assistance. And then also really changing the mindset. There's there's money to be made in a way that does good, that is inclusive and provides access to water, to sanitation, to those who need it most. And it's really changing our mindset about how we think about water really will let us go to scale and bring, um, again, that energy we need to deliver on our goals. You talked about 
getting it to who needs it most. I was talking to an activist from South Africa yesterday, and she was saying that's the problem. Money gets it, uh, you know, donated, uh, and then it gets stuck in bottlenecks with bureaucracy or, or whatever else. And so now um, she's just received direct funding to mm -hmm. her project versus it going to a big uh, hole. So that's, that's one, one way to uh, mm -hmm. approach it as well. Your thoughts, Sue, what, what comes next? What do we need to move forward? Well, I think one of the things that we need to be really clear about is the vision. Because I think we're, we've all been in the habit of um, talking about conservation action or development action kind of as an add-on or to limit the damage of the economy. If we're talking about getting all those trillions of dollars that are flowing through the economy to work for a water secure future. Mm. We talk about moving water out of the boiler room and into the boardroom. So having organizations that are running in a water secure way, they get the benefit of more efficient use. They're not having to pay pollution fines. They're managing to support the communities that they depend on who are healthier as a result. And that's integrated through the entire business and then through the economy. Banks will want to know that they're not making investments or loans that are water insecure, that, that are at risk of being stranded or at risk of being compromised by any of the water problems that we know exist. Um, and I think that's the shift we have to have in mind. It's not, let's raise lots of money and then try and counteract the damage to the economy. Let's have the economy being the vehicle mm -hmm. that solves the water crisis. And I think having that clear in our minds will really help. And it will help showcase what Danone is, is doing and the leadership that we're seeing there, integrating water security right through the business and the, and the work of the banks who are really you know, looking for those opportunities to make system level change rather than an add on here and a well here. Mm -hmm. That's the level we need to be changing. It's a huge task, isn't it? it it's uh, very encouraging. But what do you think of what's happened so far at the conference? Um, are you optimistic about what you've uh, heard or you know, what, what's been shared in, in your conversations and in the sessions so far? Um, Valerie, if we could start with you. Are you optimistic that the, the change needed change is in the air? I think there, there is a higher level of awareness uh, <coughs> that indeed there is a need and uh, we, are not, uh, we will not reach the objective at the pace that we are doing. I'm not sure that uh, really there is a uh, lot of action that has been taken and this is what I would like to see. Um, but on some side conversation, we see things happening. And this is very often much more on side conversation that you, you, know, you, you discuss with people and, and they work with you, they have some ideas and so on. So I'm, I'm more optimistic in terms of side conversation than those big events <laughs> happening where it's lots of awareness and maybe not too much action driven. Beth? So I think the, the value of, of a convening such as this and what I've seen and heard since I've been here is the high level political commitment. Is water sort of this small niche thing that you know just the Watt Sand people work on or is it the heads of state and the global leaders that are focused on water? And I think that's gonna really take us to that sort of shift, uh, systemic shift that we need. And we're starting to see that come up to the higher level rather than be a niche effort. And that's important. Sue. Well, I mean, I completely agree with what both of you have said. And I, I think it's really important to recognise where we are with water. So the last time there was a UN water conference, yeah. I was nine. Yeah. Right. So it's happening. I mean, that's brilliant that it's happening. And we have got governments and um, all the delegations, industry, private sector coming together to have this conversation. So for a start, that hasn't happened for Nearly 50 years. years, exactly. Nearly 50 years. Don't give it away. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so, you know, I think that's great for a start. I completely agree that um, we're not going to see the big, punchy, high level targets. This isn't that conference. We don't have a Paris Agreement for water, but we do have some really important goals, the SDG goals. We've got the Montreal, the recent um, COP15 target for biodiversity, which of course affects water. We've got a number of things to build on and the conversation is happening. And I think that's a big win. So let's take that. You're completely right that a lot of this will have to happen through voluntary action at the moment. But voluntary action in our experience paves the way for mandatory action because it opens up the space and demonstrates where the leaders are and removes the excuses not to act. So I think that's incredibly important. Frankly, the more sunlight we can get onto the sector leaders who are taking action, proving it's possible, and proving the benefits of doing it, 
the, the more likely we are to see the level of change that we need. Uh, closing thoughts, ladies. Valerie, we could start with you. What's your ask? If you could ask for anything to happen at this conference and beyond, what would it be? I will ask um, first for corporates to really put water as a, a key component of uh, their performances, so tracking their performances. And I will ask for partnership. I will ask really to work together because each of us, we are bringing something different on the table and it's all together that we will going to find solution and uh, impact at scale. Beth, your ask. Um, so I think we need to put water at the top of our agenda. It impacts everything that we do and we need to think differently about water. It's, it's something that we need to come together, public and private, and in order to deliver on what we need. And Sue. And I'd probably build on what they've said. What they've what said. The I, want said. Yeah. I want what they've said. Um, I, I'd like trust. Mm. I think that um, the corporates and the financial institutions who are disclosing their water footprint are making a major investment of trust. That data is then available to shape decisions. We need to see more of that. It's really quite scary really, given where most people are in this, in this journey, to be able to say, right, we get that we need to think about this and we don't know the answer yet. We all need to be able to trust each other enough to say that and share the, the search for the solutions that are out there. So I ask for trust. Wonderful, ladies. Thank you very much. We've heard about the need for the will to change things. And trust has come up several times today. Cooperation, clearly vital. This uh, world of finance uh, is a critical piece to making sure that progress is made right, in solving this crisis. And uh, one way we can secure water, a secure world is to follow the money. There is money, but currently not enough being focused on uh, projects that are helping the situation Right, Sue, you said this $1.50 out of every dollar goes to... $1 in 50. $1 in 50 goes yes. to, rather, thank you, uh, investments that are hurting versus helping. So that needs to change. And you've also highlighted the need for greater transparency, more disclosure about water footprints, and that financial institutions and investors need to change how they value water. Thank you all so very much again for that uh, and for me it was very enlightening um, and uh, i'm very grateful for all your time today